Stuart Pallister from uh, INSEAD Knowledge. Um, Professor Porter, you've been speaking here a bit about uh, how companies should face the economic downturn. What would you be your best advice at the moment? So you seem to be saying that companies should try to take a long-term approach, but for many companies will be just looking at trying to survive right now. Well, um, you know, uh, that, that's of course the, the paradox of economic downturns is that the, every, uh, every bit of pressure is pulling companies to, you know, doing whatever is necessary to survive. And of course, ultimately, companies have to survive or, you know, uh, they, they don't exist anymore. So, so in a sense, one has to be pragmatic about, about survival. But, but I guess what we found over and over again is that to survive, uh, you actually have to have a capacity to sort of integrate the short term and the long term and, and think about the two together. And you can't take actions in, in, in the short term that, that seem expedient if they ultimately don't, um, uh, if, if they ultimately undermine what's different or unique about, about the company. So, and, and, and uh, you know, companies that really overreact to the downturn, I think, get themselves in, in, into big trouble. So. Um, you know, um, for, for example, uh, you know, in a downturn, the customer almost always gets more price sensitive, <clears throat> partly because the customer is under pressure, but also partly because the, there's not many customers. And so the ones that exist know that they have power, so they, they push, push beat, beat down hard on the, on the company to try to bargain a low price. Now, suppose the company is strategically uh, really focused on providing excellent products with excellent service. You know, you might think that because the customer is more price sensitive in the downturn, then the company should actually cut back on its service and on its on its features. But actually, that's probably the worst thing it can do because then it will lose the. First of all, it will undermine its its longer term success, and and it will really become just like its competitors who are all cutting price as well. So. So the, the paradox of downturns is, is that you have to sort of simultaneously, uh, you know, kind of deal with the short term without forgetting the long term. And, and, and there's a number of different ways that I, that, that I talked about that. Um, the, the other kind of interesting point is that, um, you know, in, in normal times, companies get a lot of scrutiny every quarter in terms of their profitability. Uh, and and there's there there's always pressure to kind of you know worry about the stock price. At times like this, actually, the stock price and the quarterly profit actually doesn't matter very much uh, because nobody's going to look good. Uh, and uh, trying to look a little bit better when everybody's bad doesn't really get you much. So so, ironically, in during these periods, companies often have more flexibility to make moves and to make investments than, than, than they do during more normal periods when they're getting more you know, short-term scrutiny. So those are just a couple of, of comments that, 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 I, that, I think, uh, uh, that I think need to be uh, uh, put, put very much on, on the top of the mind. And I was trying to, 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 you know, to get the audience today to really uh, you know, not abandon st all strategic thinking <laughs> uh, just because it's a, a period of economic stress. You said that uh, you think the substance of the uh, U.S. economy is strong still, um, very strong, I think, is the way you put it. And what's happening at the moment mainly concerns the financial services sector. Why do you, why do you think that, given that there is, a, there is a marked downturn, if not recession, in Europe and the U.S.? Yeah, I, th I think the, uh, the economic recession that, that we're likely to have is, is you know, 100 percent due to the direct effects of the f problems in the financial markets, um, which now are spreading because they've affected housing, they've affected uh, credit, uh, because uh, they've affected liquidity. So, uh, but all the all the, all of this really came from the financial markets and then spread to affect other companies, many of whom. We're very strong. We're doing everything right. You know, we're well capitalized. You know, we're making good decisions. But, but they, you know, all of a sudden they couldn't issue commercial paper, or, or all of a sudden, 
uh, their demand for their products dried up, not because their products weren't good, but because the the consumers were foreclosing, you know, foreclosures were happening. So this is a very odd economic downturn. You know, it's it, in the U.S. There's no evidence that productivity is not growing. Innovation uh, exports were quite strong. Uh, U.S. companies were very successful in in, in their global strategies. Uh, getting a good market share in China and India. Uh, you know, there's a lot of new companies being formed, a lot of heavy investments in new technologies. So, you know, the, the fundamental real reality of the economy was quite strong, but, but there was sort of a cancer. <laughs> and the cancer grew and grew, and it was, it was kind of ignored. And that cancer created, uh, uh, started spreading. And it, it was so substantial and it froze the markets so much that it, that it inevitably now has affected the, the, the rest of the economy. So it's, uh, you know, we had an internet bubble, you know, in the early, uh, you know, in the early part of the 2000s. And that was, that was caused by companies that weren't fundamentally economically sound. Uh, and they and they weren't making profits, and they weren't and, and they 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 were uh, they they were it was hype about a set of companies in in really in the technology sector, and so th that was a very different situation than we have today. Here, it's not the actual fundamentally the companies in the most of the economy that are the problem. It's 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 the it's the cancer spreading from the bad decisions and over leverage. <coughs> Partly of the consumer, but but mostly in in, in mortgages and and in and over leveraging in the financial uh, sector. I just wanted to ask about your seminal works um, from 1980, 1990. Um, been used by business schools like ours, like uh, Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. um, how have you updated your um, five forces framework? You said you you you've been looking at that uh, this year. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, what, again, this is always uh, a dangerous thing, thing to say, but, but, you know, again, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, over the last couple of years kind of revisiting the industry structure model. And, um, you know, I've been, uh, this, this work has been taught and, and used in practice, you know, in, in many, many industries, and I've participated in some, some and in, in, in some cases, and many others have taken on, on the, the life of their own. Um, but, um, so, so it's, it, the, the, we've kind of applied these ideas many, many times and, 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 and had a chance to kind of learn and, and, and uh, Develop, uh, you know, and and as I re-examined those those ideas, I I found some areas where we could add uh, depth and and actually some additional uh, sort of rigor in a few areas. One example, for example, was in the areas of barrier entry. Barrier entry, um, you know, in 1980, uh, were primarily uh, on the supply side. And, and they had to do with, uh, you know, the economies of scale in, in terms of production or R&D or supply or, or whatever. Um, what we found uh, as we, as we kind of looked at what's happened since, partly because of the IT revolution, is that there's a, a really a, a, another really important case of barrier to entry that really come from the demand side around network effects. Um, that have to do with, with the sort of classic Microsoft type uh, network effects where w when many people are using a product on the demand side, it, it, it creates a tremendous barrier to entry for anybody else to put a new product into that industry. So, so that's an example of, 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 of how uh, there's a part of industry structure now because of uh, technological evolution that's more important that, than it would have been on average. Uh, on, uh, in rivalry, in the nature of rivalry, we, I think we've come to understand that that we can think about rivalry in, in a more sophisticated way now than, than we could, you know, 20, 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, but we also came to the conclusion that, that there were, there had been a number of proposals that there should be a sixth force. And uh, one of those was government. Uh, another was complements, complementary products. And, 
And after a, a lot of debate and a lot of thinking and a lot of uh, uh, discussions, uh, we really came to the conclusion that actually none of those were actually the sixth force, and that really there was only five. And uh, and again, this article talks about why it is that we reached that conclusion. So I, I guess I would say that my frameworks, whether they're the value chain or the five forces or the diamond theory uh, or clusters, are not really trying to capture trends or the latest technology or the latest circumstances. They're, they're, they're meant to really model, if you will, the, the sort of deep fundamentals and to provide a set of tools by which you can look at any set of trends at any moment in time and try to make sense about their significance for competition. So, so uh, you know, uh, of course, we keep learning about about competition, and 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 it takes new forms, and 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 there and it has there's new technologies. But, but what I've always tried to do in my work is really be independent of the particular moment in time, or the particular set of technologies that are emergent today, and and really try to focus one level deeper. And and so in that sense, I I I've, I've found that uh, the 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 frameworks have have themselves have, have, have not required uh, sort of any fundamental modification as of now. In fact, the opposite. What I found is you can take the same frameworks and really apply them to look at new things like the internet or uh, recently in healthcare. I found that, 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 that the problems we're having in healthcare delivery reflect the fact that we've not looked actually fundamentally at, at how value is created in, in, in healthcare. And, and we haven't had uh, concepts like the value chain applied to that field. And when, when we apply those fundamentals, we get really new insights in, into, the, into, the, into the topic. So um, again, there, there are many different kinds of work that are important and relevant to informing managers. Uh, and I don't pretend to, you know, to do it all. Uh, but rather focus on on uh, on a sort of a, a way of a certain way of looking at uh, some very big complicated problems that, that I, I think has been proven to be relatively um, uh, not independent of time, but 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 rather uh, ha have quite a long uh, you know shelf life, if if you will, in in terms of, uh, of 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 looking at some of these questions. So that that's the nature of the work. Thank, hey, thank you. you. Thanks.